Part three, chapter eight of Lillian by Arnold Bennett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Part three, chapter eight. Marriage. Lillian went to bed in the morning, not only with the assurance that Felix was in no danger, but with his words echoing in her heart. We shall get married here the moment I'm fit. She was nursing his body; he was nursing her mind. He had realised at once, of course, that the situation was completely altered, and that she had now one sole duty, his duty towards her. And moreover, he had cared for her pride, had not used the least word or even inflection to indicate that she was absolutely dependent on his good nature. The very basis of his attitude towards her was that he and she were indivisible in the matter. She rose about two o'clock, and she had scarcely got out of bed when the Irish nurse, Kate O'Connor, tapped at her door, and having received permission to enter, came in with a conspiratorial air. "'I heard you stirring. He's going on splendidly,' said the glinting-eyed Kate, clad from head to foot in whitest white. "'But he sent me out of the room after we'd had our little talk with Dr. Sampson, and the doctor stayed some while afterwards. Then there came another gentleman, French gentleman, and I was sent out again. He told me not to say anything to you, and I promised I wouldn't. But naturally I must tell you.' Lillian thanked her undisturbed, guessing that Felix was at work upon the arrangements for the marriage. In the night he had asked her, "'Where were you born? What parish?' And on her inquiring why he wanted to know, he had replied casually, "'Well, it's nothing, just curiosity.' But she had not been deceived. She understood him, how he loved to plan and organise their doings by himself, saying naught. The fact was that he had been asking the doctor about local lawyers, and, having learned what he desired, he had sent for the most suitable avoué, and put into his hands all the business of the marriage of two British subjects in a French town. Apparently, as he had foreseen, the chief documents required were the birth certificates of himself and Lillian, and he had telegraphed for these to his own solicitor in London. Lillian continued to receive no information concerning the progress of the formalities, and she sought for none. She lived in a state of contemplation. Her anxieties, except the vague, wonderful, and semi-mystical anxiety of far-off motherhood, had been dissipated. She was uplifted. She had a magnificent sense of responsibility, which gave her a new dignity, gravity, and assurance. Kate O'Connor called her Madam, and referred to her as Madam, especially when speaking to Felix. The assumption underlying the behaviour of everybody was that she was Felix's wife. As for the French lawyer, she never even saw him. Meanwhile, Felix's recovery was unexpectedly slow, and he went through several slight relapses. Now and then his voice would suddenly become hoarse and faint, and with the same suddenness it resumed the normal. At length he grew cantankerous. The two women were delighted, telling each other that this crotchetiness was a certain sign of strength. One day he got up and dressed fully, and sat at the window for half an hour, returning to bed immediately afterwards. The same evening he convinced Lillian that there was no more need for her to watch through the night. The next morning, when Lillian entered his room, the nurse was not there. "'I've sent her off,' Felix explained. "'I much prefer to have you with me than any nurse on earth.' He was dressed before ten-thirty. "'Now put your things on,' said he. "'What for? I don't want to go out. "'We're going out together. Look what a fine day it is. "'We're going to be married at eleven o'clock at the Marie. Now hurry up.' His voice hardened into a command. "'But, but, does Dr. Sampson agree to you going out?' she asked, quite overtaxed. "'Sampson doesn't know, as it happens, but if he did, of course he'd agree.' She might have refused to go. But could she refuse to go and be married, she the bearer of his child? She perceived that he had been too clever for her, had trapped her in his determination to regularise her situation at the earliest possible moment. She forced a timid smile and covered him up for the journey. The lift boy smiled a welcome to him. The concierge was the very symbol of attentive deference, and in the carriage enveloped Lillian's feet with the rug as though they had been two precious jewels as they were. The manager himself made a majestic appearance, and shot out congratulations like stars from a Roman candle. And the weather was supremely gorgeous. 
At the Marie waited the avoué and his clerk, who were to act as witnesses. The avoué and Felix talked to dirty and splendid officials. Felix and Lillian signed papers. "'Now you've only got one thing to do,' said Felix. "'When I nudge you, you say, "'We, oui, Monsieur Le Bear.' They were inducted into the sanctuary of celebration, and Lillian saw a fat gentleman wearing the French national flag for a waistband. It would have been very comical had it not been so impressive. The ceremony started, Lillian understanding not a word. Felix nudged her. She murmured, "'Oui, Monsieur Le Maire.' The ceremony closed. Immediately afterwards Felix handed her a sort of little tract in a yellowish-brown cover. "'You're married now, and if anybody says you aren't, show them this.' The avoué was tremendous with bows and smiles. They drove back to the hotel. They were in the bedroom. Lillian took Felix apprehensively by the shoulders. "'Oh, darling, you're sure it hasn't done you any harm?' "'And that's not quite all. There's my will,' said he. "'Ring the bell.' He spoke to Jacqueline, who, after a few minutes, brought in an English valet and an English lady's maid. Felix was set upon having his will witnessed by people with English addresses. He silently gave Lillian the will to read. He had written it himself. In three lines it bestowed upon her all that was his. Not a syllable about his sister. Well, that was quite right, because Miss Grigg had means of her own. Sitting in the easy chair, with a blotting pad on his knees, Felix signed the will. Then the valet and the lady's maid signed, with much constraint and flourish. Felix gave them fifty francs apiece, and dismissed them. "'Put that with your marriage certificate,' he said to Lillian, folding up the will and offering it to her. "'I think I'll get back to bed. Exhausting work being married,' he laughed shortly. "'I'm going to sleep,' he said later, after he'd eaten and drunk. You be off downstairs and have your lunch. But, of course, she could not go downstairs. She dropped into her bed, staggered by the swift evolution of her career. Staggered by it. Lo! She was a typewriting girl wearing wristlets, poor, hopeless, with no prospects. A little while, and lo, she was the wife of a rich and brilliant adorer, and an honest man in whom her trust was absolute. And she was pregnant. Strange fear invaded her mind the ancient fear that too much happiness is a crime that destiny will punish. End of Part 3, Chapter 8「Part 3, Chapter 9 of Lillian by Arnold Bennett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Part 3, Chapter 9 The Widow Felix seriously ill, double pneumonia. We are married. Lillian Grigg. Ten words, plus Isabel's address and her own. She wrote the telegram after several trials, in her bedroom, on half a sheet of the hotel notepaper, Kate O'Connor standing by her side, the next morning but one. "'Give it to me,' said the white nurse. "'I'll see to it for you, Mrs. Grigg, as I go home.' She looked up at the nurse, and the nurse, eyes no longer laughing, looked down at her. The nurse knew everything, and moreover must have assisted at scores of tragedies. Yet Lillian regarded her as an innocent who understood nothing essential in life. Her comforting kiss was like the kiss of a very capable child pretending to be grown up. Voices in the other bedroom. The doctor had arrived and was talking to the second nurse. They went in together. Felix lay a changed man, horribly aged. He was a man who had suddenly learned that in order to live it was necessary to breathe, and that breathing may be an intensely difficult operation of mechanics. His lined, wrinkled face was drawn with the awful anxieties incident to breathing, and with the acute pain in both lungs. The enemy was growing in strength, and Felix was losing strength, but he could not surrender. He must continue to struggle, despite the odds, and there was no referee to stop the fight either on the ground that it had developed into an assassination, or on any other ground. The brutality had to proceed. And the sun streamed through the window, and outside from the promenade where the idlers were strolling and the band was playing, the window looked exactly the same as all the other windows of the enormous hotel. After an examination, Dr. Sampson injected morphia. The result was almost instantaneous. The victim, freed from the anxiety of the pain, 
could devote the whole of his energy to breathing. He sighed, and smiled as if he had entered paradise. He gave a few short, faint coughs, like the cough of a nervous veiled woman in church, and said, in a hoarse, feeble, whispering voice, "'You must understand, Doctor, it was all my fault. I insisted, and what could she do?' The two nurses modestly bent their gaze. "'Yes, yes,' the doctor concurred. Felix had already made the same announcement several times. "'But I want everybody to know,' he persisted. "'Yes, yes,' said the doctor. "'I shall give you some oxygen this morning. It will be here in a minute. That will do you a lot of good. You'll see.' Lillian was the calmest person in the room. She had decided that there was no hope, and had braced herself and become matter-of-fact. She was full of health, power, and magnificent youth, and the living seed of Felix was within her. She quietly kissed Felix on his damp cheek. No gold now glistened in his half-empty mouth. She returned to her own bedroom, and Dr. Sampson followed. "'He's much worse,' she said firmly to the doctor. "'He is not better,' said the doctor. "'But there is always hope.' She glanced sadly at the soft and mournful face of the middle-aged doctor. Nurse Kate had told her the story of the doctor, who was a widower, and solitary, and possibly consumptive, and on account of his lungs practised on the Riviera during the winter. The vast tragedy of the world obsessed her. There was no joy nor pleasure in the whole world, and the ceaseless activities of gaiety that wearied the hotel and the casino and the town and the neighbouring towns seemed to her monstrous, pathetic and more tragic even than Felix's bed. For five days she cabled daily to Miss Grigg, and got nothing in reply. Felix's strength consistently waned, and neither morphia nor oxygen could help him more than momentarily. Jacqueline, the nurses, the doctor, treated Lillian as a holy Madonna. They all exclaimed at her marvellous steadfastness. The manager of the hotel paid a decorous call of inquiry, though it was apparent that he was already familiar with every detail, and he too treated Lillian as a holy Madonna. Two days later, in the evening, just after Nurse Kate had come on duty, Felix held out his hand for his wife's hand, and casting off his frightful physical preoccupation, said in a normal voice, "'Everything is in order. Don't be an idle woman, my poor girl.' She dropped on her knees, and, throwing her arms on his body, cried, "'Darling, I've killed you!' The thought that she had brought about his death was her continual companion. But Felix, utterly absorbed again in the ghastly effort to breathe, had no ear for the wild outburst. In the night he died. He had written a short note to his sister before the great relapse, and since then had not even mentioned her. End of Part 3, Chapter 9《Part 3, Chapter 10 of Lillian by Arnold Bennett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Part 3, Chapter 10 The Wreath. Dr. Sampson sat late with Lillian in her bedroom the next night. It was the middle of the night. He was taller than Felix, and not so old. His face was more flat and milder, but there was something in his expression and about the wrinkles round his eyes that reminded her of Felix, and he had attached himself to her to serve her. His mournful gaze appealed to her. It was he who had made her understand that death in a hotel devoted to gaiety was an indiscretion, a lapse from good taste that must be carefully hidden. He stood faithfully between her and the world, the captive of her beauty, wanting no reward but the satisfaction of having helped her. Not that much help was needed. The routine of such episodes was apparently fixed. Things moved of themselves. All requirements seemed to be met automatically. There was even an English cemetery in the region. Early on the morning after the death, a young woman in black had called to present the card of a great Paris shop with a branch in the town, and by the evening Lillian was dressed in black. The layer-out had arrived earlier yet than the dressmaker. Dr. Sampson had interviewed the manager of the hotel. 
an important part of the routine was that the whole of the furniture of Felix's room should be removed, and the room refurnished, at the cost of the representative of the dead. Dr. Sampson settled the price. Lillian decided to give the old furniture to the Alexandra Hospital. The doctor had volunteered to finance Lillian till she should be back in London. But afterwards, the equivalent of nearly four hundred pounds in French and English money was discovered in Felix's dispatch case, the inside of which Lillian had never seen. The doctor had also sent off the telegram to the mute Miss Grigg. Felix died in the night, and returning London immediately, and got the railway ticket, and accomplished the legal formalities preliminary to the burial, and warned the English chaplain, and ordered a gravestone in a suitable design, and taken Lillian's wishes as to the inscription thereon. Nothing remained to be done but wait. Lillian was quietly packing. The doctor sat watchful to assist. They both heard a noise in the next room, and at the noise Lillian was at last startled from her calm. The moment then had come. Dr. Sampson went first. The room, which ought to have been in darkness, was lighted, and not by electricity, but by two candles, one on either side of the bed. "'Who has done this?' Lillian murmured, and gave a sob. The door into the corridor was locked. To keep it locked had been part of the unalterable routine. Therefore the candles could only have been brought by somebody on the staff of the hotel. The next instant Jacqueline entered through the bathroom. She was weeping. "'Pardon me, madame, I couldn't go to bed, I couldn't sleep. And I thought of the candles. It was too much for me. I had to bring them. If I was wrong, pardon me. They will be here soon.' She threw herself down on her knees at the foot of the bed. She had spoken in French. The doctor interpreted. "'Tell her I thank her very much,' said Lillian, "'and ask her to go to bed. "'She'll have her work to do to-morrow, poor thing.' Jacqueline rose. Lillian took her hand and turned away. "'And this came,' Jacqueline added, "'pointing to a package in tissue paper that lay on a chair. "'The night porter has only just brought it up, "'and as I was coming in with the candles.' Lillian removed the tissue paper and saw a magnificent wreath of lilies, far finer than anything in her experience, a wreath for an imperial monarch. In the middle was a white envelope. She opened the envelope. It contained two French banknotes for five hundred francs each. No signature, not a word. She has got her money, thought Lillian. How? And placing the wreath on Felix's feet, she burst into tears. Jacqueline had vanished. Suddenly Lillian began to stride to and fro across the room. She was full of youth and force. She was full of fury and resentment. The moving muscles of her splendid, healthy body could be discerned through her black dress. She frightened the doctor. "'Ah!' she cried with a gesture towards the wreath. "'She is the only one that understands that I don't want to be comforted. Nobody else has understood. I expect she just heard that he was dead, and she just doesn't know that I killed him. But she understood.' She understood. The doctor, quite mystified, seized her arm to soothe her, and was astonished at her strength as she shook him off. She was like a tigress. Nevertheless, she let herself be persuaded to follow him into her own room. There her eye caught the toilet preparations which the courtesan had bestowed on her. "'And she gave me these,' Lillian laughed, hesitated, and added fiercely, "'I will take them back with me.' I will never use them, but I will keep them for ever and ever. And she cast them into one of the open trunks. Then she said calmly, Of course, I know it was because of the window of the car being broken, and it would have been all right if the engine hadn't stopped. But it was my silly, silly idea to go out for a drive at night. I can't help it. I did kill him. He'd have been alive now if I hadn't behaved myself like a perfect child. The doctor offered no remark. She resumed all her old tranquillity, wiping her eyes carefully with a fine, tiny handkerchief that Felix had given her. The bearers arrived a quarter of an hour later, discreet, furtive, and sinister. The hotel slept in its vastness. All gaiety was asleep. But even if some devoted slave of dissipation had surprised them on their way back, he could not have guessed that it was a coffin they bore. The doctor, by using his professional prestige, 
kept Lillian in her own room till the bearers were nearly ready to depart with more than they had brought. She went into the mortuary. The coffin was disguised. Picking up the wreath which had been forgotten or intentionally left, she placed it upon the coffin and beneath the disguise. It lay there, alone in its expensive grandeur. The bearers withdrew with their burden, tiptoeing along the dim, silent corridor, lest revellers should be disturbed from well-earned, refreshing sleep, and open their doors to see what was afoot in the night. The cortege was lost to view round the corner at the end of the corridor. The doctor remained a little while, and he also prepared to go. The two nurses Lillian would never see again. "'You should go to bed now and try to sleep. I'll call for you in good time tomorrow for the funeral.' Lillian shook her head. "'No, I'm going to pack his things now.' She stood at the door of his room and watched the doctor also disappear from view round the corner at the end of the corridor. End of Part 3 Chapter 10Part four, chapter one of Lillian by Arnold Bennett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Part four, chapter one, The Return. It was early in July, on one of those long summer evenings of which the melancholy twilight seems determined never to end, that Lillian, from Victoria Station, drove up to her late husband's house, now her own. The events leading to the arrival, and giving it a most poignant dramatic quality, had one after another, as they occurred, impressed everybody concerned as being very strange and sinister, but seen in perspective they took on a rather ordinary complexion. At the very moment of leaving the Riviera, Lillian had heard that Miss Grigg, on her way to the south to see Felix, had been detained in Paris by serious ptomaine poisoning due to food eaten at home. Had Miss Grigg been able to get a berth in the through Calais Mediterranean Express, she might well have died in the train. But she had not been able to get a berth, and had travelled by a service which necessitated crossing Paris by taxi. She never did cross Paris. Railway officials carried her to the hotel terminus, and medical aid was obtained just in time. For several days she was lost, like a mislaid and helpless parcel in the international post. As soon as she could move again, she returned home, for Felix was by then dead and buried. Lillian, on her part, did travel towards London by the through Calais Mediterranean Express, alighting at Calais extremely exhausted after twenty-eight hours on the railway. A gale was raging in the Channel. The steamer failed to enter Dover, a colossal harbour constructed in defiance of common sense for the inconvenience of seafarers, and put in at Folkestone. This detail changed the course of Lillian's journey. She was lifted ashore, suffering acutely from sickness and nervous shock caused by the storm. At Dover she would assuredly not have remained more than a day or two, but Folkestone is a health resort, and, installed in a big hotel on the Lees, she was tempted to let week drift after week in languid and expectant meditation. Felix's solicitors came down several times from London to, to see her and take her instructions. From him she had news of Miss Grigg and of the business, but she neither saw Miss Grigg nor heard from her. The silence between the two mourners was absolute, and Lillian would not be the first to break it. Moreover, there was no official need for letters to pass, each party being always well informed of the situation through the medium of the lawyer. At the close of the Riviera season, Lillian had a flattering surprise. Dr. Sampson, the faithful, came to see her in Folkestone. He was staying at another hotel. He desired nothing, hoped for nothing, except to exhibit his fidelity. She had in him someone upon whom she could exercise her instinct to please, and to whom she could talk about the unique qualities of Felix. But also she had grown capricious and uncertain in temper. Perceiving at once that her little outbursts charmed and delighted him, she did not check them, but rather bestowed them upon him as favours and the gloomy, fretful, transformed girl in unbecoming black played with some spirit the role of a spoiled virgin from whom a suppliant adorer anticipates one day complete surrender. It was touching, and at the same time comical. As spring glowed into summer, 
two factors gradually decided Lillian to proceed to London. Visitors increased in Folkestone. The Lees were no longer a desert, and she didn't care to be much remarked. And further, Dr. Sampson advised her to have her child in London, and to settle there well in advance of the ordeal. He suggested more than one house, but Lillian would listen to no counsel on this matter. She gave out sharply that she would have Felix's child in Felix's house, which was her house, and nowhere else. The ever silent Miss Grigg was still there, but Lillian had no objection to her staying there. She knew what was due to her husband's sister. She sent for the solicitor and invited him to make all the arrangements and to report when he had done so. In due course she journeyed to London, deliberately missing train after train on the day of departure. Dr. Sampson accompanied her to the doorstep of her house and Felix's. He paid the taxi driver, and then he shook hands and vanished. She wished to present herself alone, and to this end had postponed ringing the bell until all that Dr. Sampson could do was done. The façade of the house had been modernised, not untastefully, and was different from nearly all the other houses in Montpellier Square. The front door was of a rich, deep blue. The curtains of the windows had individuality. Lillian looked the façade up and down and from side to side. She had not even seen the house before. No, nor yet the square. Felix. It was all Felix. Felix was written right across it. And it was hers. At any rate, the lease of the house was hers. It belonged to none but herself. She knew the fact, but could not imaginatively grasp it, and the effort to grasp it made her feel faint with emotion. She was frightened. She was proud. She was ashamed. She was defiant. She was almost sick. Why did I insist on coming here like this? she thought. No girl was ever in such a position before. The blue door opened, as it were the door of a chamber of unguessed tortures. A flush spread slowly over Lillian's face. Now, she thought, now I am in the middle of it all, and can't go back. A parlour-maid stood in the doorway, tall, stiff, prim, perfect, such a creature as would have refused to recognise for fellow-creatures the cook-generals of Putney. Her mature, hard face relaxed into the minimum of a ceremonial smile. "'Oh, good evening,' said Lillian awkwardly, no better than a typewriting girl, and stepped into the house. "'Good evening, um,' said the parlour-maid. And as she realised Lillian's condition, the face relented still further, and its smile flickered into genuineness. Though her eyes and mouth showed that she was virtuous to the verge of insanity, she seemed to be moved, in spite of herself, by the spectacle of languid and soft and mourning Lillian. "'Miss Grigg wished me to say that she is engaged for the moment. She was expecting you earlier in the day. Uh, and shall I show you the principal bedroom? And if you have any orders... Uh, yes, m'am. Following Lillian's glance at her trunks piled on the porch. Uh, we've got a young man in as we'll see to him. Lillian sat down on an old carved chair with a wooden seat. How characteristic and horrid of Miss Grigg not to be ready to receive her. Not that she, Lillian, the mistress of the house, needed a reception from anyone, certainly not. This notion braced and fortified her. A young man did appear fussily from the dark basement staircase and pulled the trunks one after another within the house. The front door was then shut. The hall and upward staircase were already gently lighted for the evening. Beautiful silk shades over the two lamps. Not a very large house, nor very luxurious. But the carpets, furniture, and pictures had for Lillian just the peculiar distinction which she had hoped for. They recalled the illustrations of interiors in The Studio, which used to come every month to Putney, and they were utterly different from the Putney furniture. Felix. All Felix. No Miss Grigg. Impossible that there should be a trace of Miss Grigg anywhere. The interior had been Felix's habitation. In a sense, it was the history of Felix, his mind, his taste. She would have to study it, to learn it. This interior was the first family interior she had seen since Putney. She was entering it after a period of awful lodging-houses and garish, impersonal hotels. It was touchingly beautiful to her. The baby should be born in it, should grow up in it, should know it as the home of memory. Then it became a vision, a hallucination, and the owning of it became an illusion. How could she own it? Only yesterday Miss Grigg had thrown her out of Clifford Street with ten days' wages for a weapon to fight the whole world with. 
all that had happened since was untrue and hadn't happened. "'I'll go upstairs,' she said coldly to the parlour-maid. She had to be cold in order to be dignified. Millie Merrislate used to pose like that sometimes. The resemblance annoyed her, but what could she do in her weakness against the power of the situation? She did as best she might. On the first floor, the parlour-maid, switching lights off and on, said, "'This is the bathroom, and so on.' "'Yes, this is Miss Griggs' room,' in a hushed voice. Lillian murmured no affirmative at the face of the shut door. Her eyes had a gleam of cruelty, and involuntarily her hands clenched. The house began to grow enormous, endless. Uh, "'This is the principal bedroom?' They went into it, curtains drawn, two soft lights, a narrowish bed, the dressing-table naked, a wonderful easy-chair, polished surfaces everywhere, cunning, mild tints, the whole mysteriously beautiful. Felix. She sank into the easy-chair, drawing off her black gloves. Another maid and the young man were bumping the trunks up the stairs. "'Will you have everything brought in here, m'? "'Please.' She asked that two of the trunks should be pushed under the bed. They were Felix's. The other maid and the young man departed. "'Will you take anything, m'? "'No, thank you.' The parlour-maid softened again. "'Some tea and some nice bread and butter?' Lillian gave a smile of appreciation and thought, "'I will make this girl fond of me.' "'Up here, um. "'Yes, please.' She was alone. The room was full of secrets. She opened a wardrobe and started back. It held Felix's suits. She gazed at herself in the mirror of the naked dressing-table. Tears were slipping down her wasted white cheeks. Mechanically she pulled at a drawer. Neckties, scores of them, neatly arranged. Could one man possess so many neckties?' She picked up a necktie at random, striped in violent colours. She did not know, and could not have known, that the colours were those of a famous school club. She was entirely ignorant of the immense, the unparalleled prestige of club colours in the organised life of the ruling classes. Mechanically again, she put the necktie to her mouth, nibbled at it, bit it passionately, voluptuously. The feel of the woven stuff thrilled her, and that club necktie was understood comprehended, realised, as no club necktie ever before in all the annals of the sacred public school tradition. Lillian sobbed like a child. The parlour-maid entered with the tea and the nice bed and butter, and saw the child munching the necktie, and was shaken in the steely citadel of her virtue. "'You'll feel better when you've drunk this, m'?' said the parlour-maid lumpily, pouring out some tree. "'Hadn't you better sit down, m'? It won't do for you to tire yourself.' God! The highly trained girl so far forgot herself as to spill a tear into the milk jug. End of Part 4 Chapter 1《Part 4 Chapter 2 of Lillian by Arnold Bennett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Part Four, Chapter Two, Miss Greek. Lillian, having fulfilled the prophecy of the parlour maid and felt better after drinking the tea, had just released her shoulders from her dust cloak and dropped her forlorn little hat on the carpet, when she heard a firm, light tap. May I come in? Miss Greek entered and shut the door carefully. Lillian tried to get up from the low easy chair. Please, please, don't move. You must be exhausted. Miss Grigg advanced and shook hands. Lillian raised her eyes and lowered them. Miss Grigg was shockingly, incredibly aged. In eight months she had become an old woman, and a tragic woman. The lawyer had omitted to furnish Lillian with this information. But she was not less plump. Indeed, owing to the triumph of her instinctive negligence in attire over an artificial coquetry no longer stimulated by the presence of a worshipped man, she seemed stouter and looser than ever. She was dressed for the street. Lillian, extremely perturbed, looked at the dilapidation and thought, "'I have done this.' She also thought, "'This is the woman that turned me out of my situation because she fancied Felix was after me, not me after Felix. What a cruel shame it was!' 
and thus, though she felt guilty, she felt far more resentful than guilty. What annoyed her was that she felt so young and callow in face of the old woman, and that she was renewing the humiliating sensations of their previous interview. She felt like the former typist, and the wedding-ring on her finger had somehow no force to charm away this feeling so uncomfortable and illogical. She was not aware that her own appearance, pathetic in its unshapely mingling of the girl and the matron, was in turn impressively shocking to Miss Grigg. "'I thought I ought just to say good-bye to you before leaving,' said Miss Grigg, in a calm, polite, but quavering voice. "'Are you leaving?' Lillian exclaimed foolishly. "'I expected you to—' "'Felix left everything to you. "'I, I had nothing at all to do with the will. I—' uh... "'Oh, no, I don't suppose for a moment you had. "'Felix would never consult anybody on such matters. "'I'm not complaining. "'Felix was quite right. "'He made you his wife, and he left you everything. "'It might have been different if I'd had no money of my own, "'but, thank God, I'm independent. "'And I prefer to have my own home.' The tone was unexceptionable, and yet Miss Grigg managed to charge with the most offensive significance the two phrases, "'He made you his wife,' and "'Thank God I'm independent.' It was as if she had said, "'He raised you up from being his kept woman to be his wife. He made you honest, and he needn't have done. And, if I'd been at the mercy of a chit like you!' But Lillian, while she fully noticed it, was insensible to the offence. She was thinking as she sat huddled beneath Miss Grigg, erect. "'Who won? You didn't. I did. You thought you'd finish me, but you hadn't.' And added to this was the scarcely conscious exultation of youth and energy confronting the end of a career. The man for whom they had fought was dead and long decayed, but they were still fighting. It was terrible. Lillian's feelings were terrible. She realised that they were terrible, but they were her feelings.' Worse, crueler than all, she reflected. One day he will come and swallow your pride, and beg me humbly for a sight of his child. Miss Grigg continued with wonderful dignity. As I say, I thought it proper to stay till you had actually arrived, and formally hand over. There really there's nothing to be done. I hope you'll find everything to your satisfaction. The servants will stay, at any rate, as long as you need them. Of course I told them beforehand how things are with you. The household accounts I've given to Mr. Fargiak to-day. Mr. Fargiak was the solicitor. And, she opened her Dorothy bag, here are the keys. Masters, that's the parlour-maid, will tell you which is which. Instead of handing the keys to Lillian, she dropped them by the necktie on the dressing-table, where they made a disturbing noise in collision with the glass top, as if they had cracked the glass, but they had not. I think that's everything. "'But about the business?' Lillian asked weakly. "'Oh, yes, of course, I was forgetting. Mr. Fargiak knows all about it. I've left Gertie Jackson in charge. She's very capable and devoted. You needn't go near the place unless you care to. I've told her she should come and see you to-morrow.' "'But are you giving it up entirely?' Lillian, who had not heard a word from the lawyer as to this abandonment, was ready to cry. "'How can I give up what doesn't belong to me?' asked Miss Grigg with a revolting sweetness like the taste of horse-flesh. "'The business is yours, and it was never mine. I merely managed it.' "'Won't you take it?' Lillian burst out, losing self-control and the reaction of her natural benevolence against the awful bitterness of the scene. "'Take it all for yourself. I would so like you to have it. I know you love it.' Miss Grigg's tone in reply recalled the young widow to the dreadful proprieties of the interview. "'No, thank you.' said she coldly, with a miraculous duplicity of wounded arrogance. "'I'm only too glad to be rid of the responsibility and the hard work, at my age. I only did it all to please Felix, so that now he's dead. By the way, I think I ought to let you know that my poor brother's grave is sadly neglected, and the headstone has a terribly foreign look, and it's all sunk in sideways because you didn't give the ground time to settle before you had it fixed.' Miss Griggs by the way, information absolutely effaced the effect on Lillian of the magnificent lie which preceded it. She was staggered, and she was insulted and outraged. Had Miss Grigg dared, without warning her, to go down to the Riviera and examine Felix's grave? "'You've been there?' 
she demanded brokenly. Miss Grigg nodded. "'I ventured,' she said with haughty deference, "'to give orders about it. I hope you don't disapprove.' "'When did you go?' "'Oh, not long since,' said Miss Grigg, casually, carelessly, victoriously. "'I must leave you now. I think I've had all my own things removed, and I hope nothing that belongs to you. If there's anything wrong, or anything I can do, will you write to Mr. Fargiac?' She smiled, gravely, steadily, and shook hands, and carried off her grief, her frustration, her everlasting tragedy, safe and intact, and with pomp, away from the poor, pretty little chit whom destiny had chosen to be the instrument of devastation. Lillian sat dulled. The keys of the house lay beside the damp and creased club necktie. She heard a taxi arrive, and the door bang, and the taxi depart. A hot, dry, mournful wind of the summer night blew the curtains with a swish suddenly inwards, and made Lillian shiver. Ha! <sighs> what would she have not have given for an endless, tearful, sobbing talk with the only other creature on earth who had worshipped Felix? How she would have confessed, abased herself, accused herself, excused herself, abandoned herself, uncovered her innermost soul at the signal of one soft word from Isabel Grigg. Hellish pride! Hellish, implacable rancour, glutton of misery. The woman had not even offered a syllable of goodwill for the welfare of the coming baby. Nevertheless, Lillian's heart was breaking for Isabel Grigg. Who could blame Isabel? Or who Lillian? The situation inevitably arising from their characters and from the character of the dead man had overpowered both of them. Lillian thought of the neglected grave and of the courtesan's prayer. Eternal peace, no emotions, strip straight out, quiet for ever and ever, eternal peace. In the indulgence of grief and depression, she wanted to keep that thought. But she could not. She was too young and too strong, and the edges of the dangerous future were iridescent. End of Part 4, Chapter 2《パート四、チャプター三、オブ・リリアン》by Arnold Bennett。This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers。パート四、チャプター三、The Lieutenant。リリアン slept heavily and without moving, and when the parlour maid aroused her with more tea at nine o'clock, according to order, she drank half the first cup before the process of waking was complete. Her mind had been running jerkily. So she actually went all that way to see his grave. "'and I haven't seen the stone myself. "'Of course Felix wrote to her when he was getting better "'and told her he was going to marry me. "'That's how she must have first known I was out there with him. "'He wrote on purpose to tell her. "'And she went all that way to see my darling's grave "'and never said a word to me. "'It's her feeling for Felix makes her so cruel, poor thing. "'Oh, but she's so hard, hard. "'Well, I could never be hard like that. "'I don't care what happened.' "'and it won't make her any happier.' "'The parlour-maid returned with a parcel. "'Oh, yes, I know what that is,' said Lillian. "'Just cut the string and put it down here, will you? "'Miss Jackson is waiting to see you. "'Will you see her, or shall I ask her to call to-night?' "'Miss Jackson!' Lillian exclaimed, "'agitated by the swiftness of the sequence of events. "'Has she been waiting long?' "'No, only about twenty minutes. "'Why didn't you tell me before?' "'I thought you ought to have your tea quiet, mm. "'How nice of you,' said Lillian, with a weak, acquiescent smile. "'But do ask her to come in here now. "'She won't mind me being in bed, will she?' Oh, "'I should hope not, mm, said the parlour-maid, pawing the ground. "'Lillian pushed her lustreless hair out of her eyes. "'The sun was shining on part of the tumbled bed. "'Then Gertie Jackson came in. "'Absolutely unchanged, the same neat provincial Islingtonian toilette, the same serious, cheerful, ingenuous gaze, the same unmarred complexion, the same upright pose and throwing back of the shoulders in unconscious rectitude and calm intention to front courageously the difficulties of the day, the same mingling of self-respect and deference. She bent over the bed. Lillian held up her face like a child with mute invitation, and Gertie kissed her. What a fresh, honest, innocent, ignorant kiss on Lillian's hot, wasted, experienced cheek. "'You poor thing,' Gertrude murmured devotedly. 
"'I'm seven months gone, nearly,' Lillian murmured, as if in despair. "'Well, it'll soon be over, then,' said Gertie buoyantly, in a matter-of-fact tone. "'Yes, but shall I ever again be like I was?' Lillian demanded gloomily. "'Of course you will, dear. And prettier. They almost always are, you know. I've often noticed it.' "'You dear,' cried Lillian. "'And do you mean to say you've got up earlier and come all the way down from Islington here to see me before going to the office? And me keeping you waiting?' "'Why, but of course I came. I'm responsible to you now, now poor Miss Griggs gone. I told her I would be. And I can't tell you how glad I shall be if I suit you and you find you can keep me on. It's such a good situation.' Lillian lifted her face again and kissed her. But not the kiss of gratitude, though there was gratitude in it. The kiss of recompense, of reward. It was Lillian, who, in allowing herself to be faithfully served, was conferring the favour. Gertrude was the eternal lieutenant, without ambition, without dreams, asking only to serve with loyalty in security. In that moment Lillian understood as never before the function of these priceless Gertrudes, whose first instinct, when they lost one master, was to attach themselves to another. "'Look here,' said Lillian, "'do you know what I want? I want you to come and live here till it's over.' "'Of course I will,' Gertrude agreed, eagerly ready to abandon her domestic habits and interior for as long as she was required to do so, and to resume them whenever it might suit Lillian's convenience. And all because Lillian had been beautiful and successful, and would be beautiful and successful once more. "'You must come to-night, will you?' Lillian insisted, transformed in a moment into the spoilt and exacting queen. Gertrude nodded, brightly beaming. "'I do so want to talk to you,' Lillian went on. "'I've had nobody to talk to for, I mean, like you.' "'Do you know, Felix would have been alive now if it hadn't been for me?' She burst into tears, and then, recovering, began an interminable detailed recital of events on the Riviera, coupled with the laudation of Felix. She revelled in it, and was shameless, well aware that Gertrude would defend her against herself. The relief which she felt was intense. At the end of half an hour, when the torrent had slackened, Gertrude said, "'I really think I'd better be going now.' "'What time would you like me to come to-night? "'I'm quite free, because I've not taken night duty this week. "'It's Millie's week.' "'And as she was leaving, she turned back rather nervously to the bed. "'Do you mind me suggesting one thing? "'I wouldn't have you overtire yourself, "'but if you could just show yourself at the office, "'I feel it would be such a good thing for all of us. "'The girls would understand, then, who the new employer is. "'Some of the very stupid, you know. "'If you could just show yourself a quarter of an hour. "'It's for your own sake, dear.' "'As I am, I mean, you know.' "'Why not? But would they?' "'Of course not.' Blandly and firmly decided Gertrude, who had been brought up in Islington, where the enterprise of procuration proceeds on an important scale and in a straightforward spirit. Strange that in Gertrude's virginal mentality such realism could coexist with such innocent ingenuousness. But it was so. When Gertrude had left, Lillian opened the parcel. It was from Dr. Sampson, and contained two books recommended and promised by him about preparing for motherhood, and motherhood, and cognate matters. The mere titles of the chapters entranced her. End of Part 4, Chapter 3《Part 4, Chapter 4 of Lillian by Arnold Bennett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Part 4. Chapter 4. The New Employer. Appreciably less than a year had passed since she went down those office stairs, thrust out by the implacable jealousy of Miss Grigg, and yet in the short time the stairs had shrunk and become most painfully dingy. The sight of them saddened her. She wondered how it was that their squalor had not affected her before. She felt acutely sorry for the girl named Lillian Share who in the previous autumn used easily to run up them from bottom to top, urged by the consciousness of being late. Now she had to take the second flight very slowly. The door opened as she reached it, and Gertie Jackson emerged to usher her in. A dozen pairs of ears had been listening for her arrival. The doors of both the large and the small rooms were ajar, and she had glimpses of watching faces as she went with Gertrude into the principal's room. She was intensely nervous and self-conscious. 
Gertrude explained that Miss Grigg had installed her in the principal's room months ago, and Lillian said that that was quite right, and Gertrude said that she hoped Lillian would approve. Tea was laid on one of the desks, a dainty tea, such a tea as Lillian had never seen in the office, with more pastry than even two girls could eat who had had no lunch and expected no dinner. An extravagant display. Then a flapper entered with the teapot and the hot water jug, and Lillian smiled at her, and the flapper blushed and smiled and tossed her winged pigtail. The flapper had a shabby air. Lillian could swallow only one cake, because Gertrude was sitting where Felix had sat when he first told her what she might do, and ought to do with herself. "'I'm so glad you've come,' said Gertrude, in a sort of rapture. "'Yes,' Lillian agreed with dignity. "'I was bound to come, of course.' She felt wise and mature and tremendously aware of her responsibilities, and she intended to remain so. Nobody should be able to say of her that she had lost her head, or that she was silly or weak, or in any way unequal to her situation. Above all, Miss Grigg should be forced to continue to respect her. "'I suppose I'd better just go and see them all now,' she suggested, after more tea. "'They'd be delighted if you would,' said Gertrude, as if the thing had not already been arranged. Naturally, Lillian honoured the small room first. The three inhabitants of the small room, two of them were unknown to her, sprang up, flattered, ruffled, flustered, excited, at her entrance. There she stood, the marvellous, the semi-legendary Lillian, who had captured the aristocratic master, run off with him to the continent, married him, buried him, inherited all his possessions, and was soon going to have a baby. Her famous beauty was under eclipse. Her famous figure had grown monstrous beyond any possible concealment. But she was still marvellous. She was the most romantic figure that those girls had ever seen. She was all picture-paper serials and cinema films rolled together and come to life in reality. Her prestige was terrific. She felt it, and knew it, and acted on it. How pathetically common the girls were, how slave-like, how cheap their frocks! How very small the room! but evidently it had been tidy for her visit. She recognised one of the old Underwoods by a dent in its frame, and remembered the stain on one of the green lampshades, and the peculiarities of the woodwork of the absurdly small mirror. She was touched. She might have wept a little, but her great pride, in her achievement, in her position, in her condition, even in her tragic sorrow, upheld her safely. Tenderly invited to sit down, she sat down, and she put expert questions, to the wonderment of practising typists, thus proving that she was not proud. And then, with gracious adieu, she proceeded to the large room, where, though her stay was properly more brief, she created still more sensation. In the large room she surprised one or two surreptitious exchanges of glance, portraying a too critical awareness on the part of some that she had sinned against the code, and perhaps only saved herself by the skin of her teeth. These unkind exhibitions did not trouble her in the least. The demeanour of the more serious and best-paid girls showed absolutely no arrière-pensée, and better than anybody else they knew what was what in the real world. Gertrude Jackson, the honest soul of purity, already adored her employer. As these two were returning to the principal's room, the entrance door opened, and Millicent Medislate burst breathlessly in. "'How splendid!' exclaimed Gertrude. She had sent a special message to Milly, and Milly, for a sight of her new mistress, had got up and come to the office two hours earlier than her official time. Lillian was amazed, and very pleased. She remembered that she had once spent at any rate one night of toil in perfect friendliness with the queer, flat, cattish Millicent, and now she insisted on Milly helping them to eat cakes in the sacred room. The scene was idyllic. A little later, Lillian, having arranged the details of Gertrude's temporary removal to Montpellier Square, announced that she must go, on account of some important shopping. Gertrude, sternly watchful against undue fatigue for Lillian, raised her eyebrows at the mention of shopping, but Lillian reassured her. A taxi was fetched by the flapper of all work, and, noticing then for the first time that the road repairs in the neighbourhood were all finished, and every trace of them vanished, Lillian gave the driver an address in Piccadilly. Several girls were watching her departure from the windows. Her upward glance caught them in the act, and the heads disappeared sharply within. "'They are all working for me,' she thought with complacency. 
and could scarcely believe the wonderful thing. End of Part 4, Chapter 4《Part Four, Chapter Five of Lillian by Arnold Bennett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Part Four, Chapter Five, Layette. The pride of her reception in Clifford Street wafted her easily up the somewhat austere stairs of the first-floor establishment in Piccadilly. She had long been familiar with the face of the commissionaire and the brass signs of this mysterious shop but never till the leading word attracted her eyes as she was driving from Montpellier Square to Clifford Street had it occurred to her what the word signified. The deceiving staircase led to splendid rooms, indicating that the renown of the establishment could not be spurious. A bright and rosy young woman came smilingly forward and gave Lillian a chair. One other customer, a stout lady with her back to the world, was being served in a distant corner. A marvellous calm reigned, and the noise of Piccadilly seemed to beat vainly against the high, curtained windows. Layettes? Lillian began questioningly, with a strange exultation. The aspect of the interior had revived her taste for luxury, while giving it a new direction. Uh, yes, madam. The esoteric conversation was engaged. Lillian sat entranced by the fineness and the diminutiveness and the disconcerting elegance of the display ranged abroad for her on the glass counter. She was glad that, through culpable sloth, she had done absolutely nothing as yet with her own needle. It was the books from Dr. Sampson that had aroused her to the need for action of some sort, for she had had no wise woman to murmur in her eager ear the traditions and the Spanish etiquette of centuries of civilised maternity. "'I shall bring Gertie to see these tomorrow. she thought. "'It will please her frightfully to come, and she'll stop me from being too extravagant. "'Only I must arrange it so that her work won't be interfered with, perhaps at lunch-time. "'Never do to upset discipline right at the start.' "'And she asked to see still more stock. "'The article stimulated her memory and her imagination "'into a kind of tranquil and yet rapturous contemplation of the events, "'voluptuous, tender, and tragic.' which had set her where she was. The thrill of conception, the long patience of gestation, the coming terror of labour, mingled altogether in her now mystical mind. Her destiny had been changed, or at least it was gravely diverted. Instead of glittering in public as the lovely darling and blossom of luxurious civilization, and in private rendering a man to the highest possible degree happy, instead of this she was secretly and obscurely building a monument, in her body and also in her heart, to Felix. Felix, whom already she had raised to be the perfect man. Felix, who might have been alive then if she had not one evening behaved like a child, or if his sense of his duty towards her had not been so imperious. Her common sense had at last cured her of regarding herself as his murderess. Whether she had loved him to the height of which she was capable of passionate love was doubtful, but she had profoundly admired him. She had been passionately grateful to him for his love of her. And, come what might when her beauty was restored to its empire, no other man could ever stand to her in the relation in which Felix had stood. He had set his imprint upon her, and created her a woman. And so she was creating him a god." All these movements of her brooding mind originated from the spectacle of the articles on the counter. They did not prevent her from discussing layettes with the bright, rosy shop-girl. That innocent, charming, and unimaginative young creature fingered the treasures with the casualness of use. For her, layettes were layettes, existing of and for themselves. They connoted nothing. End of Part 4, Chapter 5 End of Lillian by Arnold Bennett